The organization, several murders, could do us both a great deal of good. Look, Chalmers, let's understand each other. I don't like you. Come on now, don't be naive, Lieutenant. We both know how careers are made. Integrity is something you sell the public. You sell whatever you want, but don't sell it here tonight. Frank, we must all compromise. A Bullshit. Little. Get the hell out of here now. Vasudevaya Vasudevaya The institutional delusion that appears to be Sri the Prabhupada's movement did not just happen overnight. It has always been a work in progress and continues to be so. While ISKCON itself, the real movement of the 60s and 70s, is dead, choked off by this weed known as the fabricated so called ISKCON Confederation. That Sahajya movement, an Upa Sampradaya of the worst sort, has no shortage of acolytes and enablers who gloss over all of its many deviations. They do not hold its leaders to task in the matter of their leader's obligation, if those leaders were bona fide, which of course they are not, to make a compelling case based upon Shastra, knowledge, and reason as to the spiritual and devotional validity of their current operation in terms of its historical precedent. The fact of the matter is that there is no justification for what ISKCON misleaders are doing and for what they falsely claim is being accomplished by their cult. In no small part this is because those leaders have a different view about what constitutes the ISKCON legacy, its rationality, its justification, and its so-called history. Their corporate power and personal ambitions suffice for them and their followers as proof enough of the validity of their project. Since they have gotten away with so many compromises over the past 40 years, within their circles, confidence is high that they will continue to pull off their scam for as far as the eye can see. But as Joe Kidd said in the motion picture of the same title, maybe, maybe not. Always remember that Humpty was pushed so-called ISKCON did not proliferate without substantial assistance from the rank and file. And, on the other hand, it will not be exposed, checked, and stopped without a great deal of resistance by us either. Because it is up to us to call those misleaders out for all the, their major contradictions their major deviations, and of course, all of their compromises. Now, your host speaker is going to discuss three of these major deviations in this particular discourse, as we did in last month's discourse. These three went down in the 70s, and the only standard justifying them is might makes right void by the tyranny of the ISKCON majority. 
That majority, of course, includes everyone who strongly believes in and is connected to so-called ISKCON, not just the most egregious players. All of these rascals couldn't care less whether or not their philosophical theories, or if you prefer, justifications, are coherent and free from contradiction. As long as the ISKCON philosophical system and its processes are authorized by the vitiated governing body commission, it is right in their eyes and everyone with a different take is wrong, offensive, and a no-count fringy. The dissidents, such as your host speaker, are ignored at this time, but that may not remain the case in the future. If you are able to assimilate what is being spoken here and act upon the knowledge you are receiving, it will have an effect on you and for the better. The hardcore leaders, party men, fanatics, and similarly dedicated followers of so-called ISKCON have no need within their echo chamber to defend or apologize for anything that their cult represents. Those backslappers have all persuaded one another that what they have established over time, despite so many jarring speed bumps, in which all of those speed bumps have been pinned on scapegoats who are no longer part of their movement, that it's all the direct will of God and completely pleasing to Srila Prabhupada. Is that so? Is His Divine Grace actually pleased with such a big, big international corporation that is chock full of cheap gurus and cheap disciples. On Wikipedia, for example, in its own description of itself, the GBC, with considerable hubris, states that it exercises the power to appoint initiating gurus for the cult it controls. In other words, the appointment theory is still active. And not that long ago on Wikipedia, it also claimed to be the actual successor in disciplic succession to his divine grace. A corporate entity being the successor. Although that declaration was taken down when challenged by some of its own party men. After the colossal hoax of the 11 Sahajya pretender Mahabhagavats, is Prabhupada pleased? with all that has been let loose from the ISKCON Pandora's box as a result, those zonal acharyas overlorded everyone via obnoxious and suffocating international fiefdoms for just short of a decade. Is Prabhupada pleased with what has been done in the form of massive and unnecessary changes to his Bhagavad Gita as it is so soon after his departure? Is he pleased with the compromises and contradictions that are the hallmark of today's, in their own words, ISKCON line? Now, as you know, all of these were rhetorical questions, of course. Here in part two of this four-part series, your host speaker is going to analyze five events. These five are alleged to be major events that worked to degrade Prabhupada's movement while he was still physically manifest. However, only three of them actually qualify as major events and deviations because the other two, and we will discuss those first, do not merit that status. The reasons why those two do not merit the status are different from each other and those reasons will be made crystal clear. However, they did have something in common, and that personality will be pointed out. 
And after we discuss these two, we shall move on to the three major events which actually do qualify as major deviations. Although, as mentioned in part one, one of these in and of itself is not at all a deviation. However, neglect of the two essential orders, the two essential orders contained in it by his divine grace, mark it as a precursor for arguably the worst deviation of the twelve. That very egregious deviation will be discussed in the third installation of our four-part series next month. Now one further note. The other two that constitute major events besides that precursor may at first glance appear to be rather minor. You should not allow such a misconception to take hold within yourself. Those two, different from the event that was the precursor for the deviation we shall discuss next month, are both based on compromises that should have never been made. Now in this discourse, all five of these that we're now discussing had one element in common, and that was the crypto-Talmudic Machiavellian manipulator TKG. He was implicated in every one of them, even if one of those cannot technically be established with certainty as an event. Let us therefore consider the first of these five that we're discussing in this discourse. In the mid-70s, the RDTSKP was formed by TKG with Vishnu John as his kirtan leader. This traveling bus party consisted of only brahmacharis and sannyasis, with TKG clearly the sannyasi in charge. It was only a United States phenomenon, but it did cause quite a stir movement-wide in almost every American temple. Basically, each bus party acted like a ship of pirates as it sailed from Iskan Temple to Iskan Temple. The presidents were duty-bound to assist those parties because, after all, a lot of magazines were being distributed by those bus party devotees throughout the states. They were making some new bhaktas at the campuses. And over and above that, householders are ob obligated to assist sannyasis in their missions. Now, as most of you know, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of temple presidents in those days were householders. Prabhupada wanted it that way. And the householder devotee is said to be on a level a lower than the sannyasi in purity and realization. TKG, who was not a genuine sannyasi, not only took full advantage of this, he exploited it for all it was worth. He preached to all the young men, the new people on his buses, that the householders in the temples were in Maya. They should be seen as fallen devotees. And as such, they did not deserve brahmacharis serving under them in those temples. Another way of saying the same thing is that the RDTSKP buses were, when they arrived at the doorstep of various U.S. temples, little more than raiding parties. They preached the same line as could be expected to the brahmacharis in those temples, and as could only have been predicted, many of those temple devotees fell for it, became enamored, much more with Vishnu John than with TKG, and joined one of the bus parties. Your host speaker, an unmarried student at the time, had direct experience of all of this at the St. Louis Yatra in early 1975. Indeed, that particular bus party that stopped there took the raiding strategy to the next level by actually controlling the St. Louis Temple while its president was in Mayapur, India. TKG was also there in Bengal and was in regular contact with his lieutenant in St. Louis commandeering the Midwest takeover. 
Once it was close to complete, TKG manipulated the GBC, something he was quite expert at, into approving a new administration for St. Louis to be run by his man. The whole saga was chock full of all kinds of intrigue, treachery, and betrayal shot through it, including the hell your host speaker had to go through in order to surreptitiously escape the scene. The RDTSKP campaign, which employed the plainclothes pick just as much as the temples did, could be explained in more detail, of course, but we're not going to get into any of that here because it would be extraneous. As most of you know, the householders eventually revolted en masse against TKG, culminating in him being driven from power, Vishnu John committing suicide, and Prabhupada ordering TKG to Red China. He was unsuccessful there, and he returned a broken man. He never forgave Prabhupada for that. Hidden and bottled up within him, his resentment against Prabhupada was immeasurable, but it would shortly be fully demonstrated. The point here, however, is that the RDTSKP escapade was, in and of itself, nothing more than a chapter, albeit an important and lengthy one, within an all-encompassing book in ISKCON. And what was the title of that book? Well, we already discussed it last month. The Plain Clothes Pick. There were so many manifestations of it, and RDTSKP was but one of them. Instituting and training all the collectors in the movement in the change-up was another such manifestation. As described last month, all of the results-oriented pick constituted the third major deviation and event. To sum it all up, the RDTSKP escapade was a sub-event, part and parcel of the kinds of shenanigans for Krishna that proliferated in the mid-70s and late-70s as the plain clothes pick devolved more and more. So we've discussed one of these now. We're going to go to the second one, which turned out not to be a major event or a major deviation, but for a different reason. And the next one only appears to be eligible for consideration. It was during 1977, the last year in which Prabhupada was with us, leading to his disappearance from physical manifestation in November of that year. The question is, was Srila Prabhupada poisoned? In October of 1977, he distinctly and directly said, quote unquote, someone has poisoned me. Was one or more of his caretakers, all of whom were his initiated disciples, responsible for it? If so, that would have been the crime of the century. Is there evidence? There's quite a bit of it, as a matter of fact. Is it strong evidence? In the opinion of your host speaker, it is anything but weak. Does that evidence that Prabhupada was poisoned by an inner coterie of his caretaker disciples constitute proof that it went down? Simply put, it does not. There was and is no smoking gun. No one in that inner circle ever admitted to it, including TKG, and all who have been accused of being part of it have denied any such implication. Was TKG part of that group? Ugh. He was the centerpiece of it. If Prabhupada was poisoned by his own disciples, TKG would have had to have been in on it, and he would had to have been engineering it. Is there evidence that he did so? There is such evidence. For starters, just days after Prabhupada left the scene, in an interview with Satsvarup, referring to mercy killing, 
which TKG indicated Prabhupada was requesting in the last months, TKG said, quote-unquote, we could have done that. Is there counter evidence to this theory that Prabhupada was poisoned by his own disciples? As a matter of fact, there is. Prabhupada also said in his final days with us, quote-unquote, not that I am poisoned. The context of what he was referring to and meant by that statement is subject to dispute, as is almost everything surrounding this allegation. And that's what disqualifies this controversy as constituting one of the 12 major events or deviations that led to the growth and takeover of the Hare Krishna movement by the fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation. We know that Prabhupada left us prematurely and that has had a very profound effect upon all of his dedicated disciples. In and of itself, however, that he left us prematurely cannot be considered some kind of deviation. It also cannot be pinned to the formation and growth of so-called ISKCON, at least not directly. If Prabhupada was poisoned by some of his leading men, that would definitely make our list and expand it to a baker's dozen. However, that he was poisoned by his own disciples is not in the category of an incontrovertible fact. Now, the most staunch proponent of the poison theory, or some call it the poison story, is without question Nityananda Prabhu. He spent many, many thousands of his own money, his own dollars, securing and researching tapes containing background whispers, suspicious whispers, testing them with high-priced forensic experts for the validity of what he thought those background whispers were saying. Yananda also was able, with the help of similar experts in a different science, to detect ultra-high quantities of cadmium in Prabhupada's hair samples from his last months. Yananda Prabhu took all kinds of risks in these undertakings. He spent all kinds of money. He engaged in a number of sleuth efforts in order to uncover evidence that would most certainly have otherwise disappeared. He received all kinds of flack even from those who were supposedly cooperating with him. That's a long story. And in the late 90s, when his efforts to create a CD were thwarted, he authored a book entitled, Someone Has Poisoned Me. And it is a very compelling read. Now at this time on the internet, Nityananda has posted a longer version of the same theme with updated information. The title of that internet work is Kill Guru, Become Guru. He has also created, and is the host speaker of, a number of professionally produced and colorful videos, fully augmented by excellent soundtracks and appropriate background music. Now in that online manuscript, as different from the DVDs, he goes over all of the evidence, all of the factors, and all of the related details to those factors and those evidences of what he believes to be Prabhupada's intentional poisoning, and he, he makes a list of them. And in the final analysis, he assigns each one of these factors, all of these components, to the theory that Prabhupada was poisoned by his own disciples, led by TKG. And he gives each one of them a percentage value, each component. He adds all of the evidences up, and they total 97%. This is obviously a very, very high percentage of likelihood that the poisoning went down in the dreadful way that Nityananda describes that it did. However, 97% does not constitute a metaphysical lock. It's not 100%. In other words, 
the truest of the true believers of the poison theory, its strongest proponent in terms of Prabhupada being poisoned by his own disciples led by TKG, concludes that it is extremely probable that he was poisoned in that way, but not necessarily certain. So this so-called event is a controversy and it cannot make our list of 12, but let us now move on to the fourth major deviation, which does make the list of 12 and which certainly contributed to the formation, growth, and takeover of the Hare Krishna movement by so-called ISKCON. Now, as you may remember, in part one, we covered three of these last month. Actually, it was two months ago. And we have just detailed two which do not qualify for the twelve. Now we're going to go on to the fourth major event, which does qualify and which constituted a compromise by the rest of the GBC to and for the benefit of TKG and of course it thus centers around him. Now as I mentioned previously here some may consider this to be a rather minor thing but neglecting its actual import is a major mistake. It is certainly a mistake. In a letter to a European GBC dated January 27, 1975, Prabhupada reminded that GBC that he wanted his commissioners to rotate on a regular basis as his personal secretaries. Here's the quote. Under the circumstances, I have asked Hank Seduta to come to me at Hawaii. There I shall try to rectify the mistakes and as previously arranged the GBC should act as my secretary at least one month in a year. Now the folio does not readily show us where and when that previous arrangement had been made, which undoubtedly had been approved by Prabhupada. But it had been made. Perhaps it was part of a room conversation that was never recorded with his leading secretaries. Nevertheless, the above-mentioned excerpt from the letter substantiated that this arrangement had been made. Now your host speaker did some research on this and consulted a former commissioner about this arrangement and he verified that it was supposed to take place. The arrangement to rotate GBCs on a monthly basis should have been adhered to and if it had the disaster, the debacle that befell the movement post Prabhupada probably would have been avoided. At least one of those men who had rotated as a personal secretary would have probably spotted the glaring defects in the 1978 GBC resolutions, which established the zonal acharyas, their Uttama Adhikari worship, and also the so called Acharya board. Many of the governing body commissioners were supposed to have had that close personal association with Prabhupada in his last months, but most of them didn't. Now, going back to 1976, basically, in the first part of 77, there had been seven leading men, almost all of them either sannyasis or commissioners, who served as Prabhupada's personal secretary from the time of early 1976 until late February 1977. Early February 76 to late February 77. It's about one year. And that averages to each of them serving for about one and a half months, although as it played out, they did serve for different lengths of time. So you could say that that arrangement was not so far removed from the arrangement Prabhupada wanted and mentioned in the letters excerpt that we just read. Such a regular rotation should have been continued, but TKG saw to it that it wasn't. And of course the GBCs compromised with him once again on this, allowing him to remain as the sole personal secretary until the very end. That was not the first time 
that they acquiesce to the wishes of the Machiavellian manipulator, but it would be a distraction to get into any of the other stuff. Allowing TKG to become the sole gatekeeper to Prabhupada in his last months set the stage for all kinds of serious problems that almost immediately ensued after Prabhupada departed physical manifestation. Why? Because TKG kept things confidential that should not have been kept confidential and which would have been otherwise well known or at least better known. TKG made all of the decisions, the big decisions concerning Prabhupada during those last months. For example, TKG decided who could and would have access to Prabhupada and TKG was also Prabhupada's caretaker although applying that noun to him is quite an anomaly. The governing body commission was obligated not to have allowed the monopoly of Prabhupada's care and access to have been controlled by one man and adding injury to insult TKG was the very worst choice possible as having been allocated that position and power. Allowing TKG to dominate the person, quarters, and maintenance of Srila Prabhupada for the last nine months that he was with us is firmly in the category of a major event in the Hare Krishna movement. It was also a major mistake just as importantly, it was a deviation from a previous arrangement, which would have, in all likelihood, worked out much better for the movement and for all the devotees at large. Now, if you have developed higher intelligence, you will surely recognize, if you've not already done so, that the GBC allowing TKG to be the final caretaker for all of those months certainly promoted the formation, growth, and empowerment of the fabricated so-called ISKCON oligarchy after Prabhupada left. Tatvamasi. Now we shall move on to the fifth major event, which indirectly assisted in the emergence of so-called ISKCON. This was a room conversation at the Krishna Balaram Temple in Prabhupada's quarters held on May 28, 1977. There is strong indication that all of the GBCs attended, or certainly most of them attended, this very important meeting. In the folio, the meeting is listed as quote-unquote GBC meets with Srila Prabhupada. By this time, May of 1977, it was becoming very obvious that Prabhupada may be leaving the scene soon as his physical body, so to speak, sometime before this even was showing drastic signs of deterioration. As such, the GBC decided that he had to be asked about how his movement was to conduct initiations, especially after he departed physical manifestation. Now, as you all know, TKG was running the show for over three months at that time, so he, along with Satsvarup, were selected to ask Prabhupada this very delicate question. Actually, this meeting on May 28, 1977, covered many topics, but the interlude, wherein Prabhupada was asked two important questions concerning initiations, was by far the heart and soul of the whole meeting. Indeed, many initiated disciples of His Divine Grace consider this room conversation to be the most important one ever held in the Hare Krishna movement. The questions concerning initiation, both current, meaning at that time in 1977, and future, meaning after Prabhupada departed, were the very, at the very center of this meeting. Now, as mentioned previously in this discourse, and we also mentioned this in last month's, or two months ago in that presentation, this fifth major event, the GBC meeting Prabhupada in late May of 1977 at Krishna Balaram, did not in and of itself constitute a deviation. How could it? 
Prabhupada was asked two essential questions about initiation, and he answered both of them. Yet it makes our list of 12 because unlike the other 11 events which did directly constitute deviations, this room conversation created a precursor which led to deviation, although it was certainly not meant to do so. I have a question. Dr. Ernest. Obviously, the future event linked to this room conversation is the appointment of Zonar Acharyas by the GBC in March of 1978, along with their being sanctioned as initiating spiritual masters to be worshipped as Mahabhagavats. Why then should the room conversation of 1977 even be listed amongst the 12 events when the real deviation was made 10 months later in Mayapur? We shall be discussing that real deviation in Mayapur in 78, but it's a good question. And it was a tough call for me to make. However, the room conversation in May of 1977 needs to be listed for some important reasons. First, there is injudiciousness in how the conversation proceeded during those exchanges on initiation between the two sannyasis and Prabhupada. Secondly, a new term, but not a new concept, was introduced by Prabhupada, one that serves as the crux that should have been recognized by all the GBCs during the last week of March in Mayapur, 1978, although it most definitely was not. These two reasons factored into the colossal hoax of 1978, and they factored into the appointment of Ritvix in July of 1977 in terms of how that was misinterpreted later on. And they also strongly factored in to making what should have been a clear distillation of what Prabhupada wanted and ordered into just another brick in the wall of cloudy conclusions that have muddied the issue of our disciplic succession to this very day. In other words, the GBC came to Krishna Balaram in May of 1977 to clear up two important questions about how to proceed, but due to the mind-boggling ineptitude of the leading secretaries selected to ask those questions, the actual conclusions were misinterpreted. This led in part to the major deviation of 1978 and is thus inextricably tied to it. As such, this room conversation of May 1977 has to be listed amongst the 12 chief events presented in this multi-part series, the 12 chief deviations, because the room conversation exemplifies just how complacent, foolish, corrupt, and inept the GBC was even before Prabhupada departed. The room conversation thus proves how the GBC was already prone to spoil everything for his movement and for his disciples that he wanted after his departure. So in answer to your question over and above this, the two events, the room conversation of 1977 and the unauthorized appointment of 11 zonal acharyas, as Mahabhagavat so called, are inextricably tied together as distinctions without a difference. Nevertheless, since they transpired at different times, they have to be listed and discussed separately. So now let's get into the actual details here. Prabhupada was asked by Satsvarup, quote, our next question concerns initiations in the future, particularly at that time when you're no longer with us, unquote. 
Not everybody has spotted the Maya that's present in his phraseology because he said it was one question, our next question, when in point of fact it was two questions. Prabhupada did answer both of those questions. He answered them separately, and his answers for each of them were very different. Now, the first question concerned initiations at that time in 1977, and Prabhupada said ISKCON was to resume initiations via the Ritvik process, which had been going on since 1970, but it had been put on hold for some months due to Prabhupada's severe illness. His devotees didn't want him taking the Sancha to Karma from all the new people. But the conversation gets muddied right away, again by Satsrup, more severely, by asking seconds later, quote unquote, then what is the relation of that person who gives the initiation and the Prabhupada cuts him off? Up to that point, his divine grace was answering only the first question, and his answer was reestablish the Ritvik system. However, Satsrup now brings into the whole thing the concept of quote unquote who gives the initiation. That's not the Ritvik. Prabhupada, in cutting Satsrup off, answers directly he's Guru. The person who gives the initiation is Guru. Satsvarup, channeling heavy Mahamaya, continues the muddle by mixing the initiating spiritual master with the Ritvik. SDG then says, quote unquote, but he does it on your behalf. Everything is diving straight down south into a tautology by this time. Satsvarup has brought the topic back to Ritvik. The Ritvik conducts the ceremony as the priest. So Prabhupada states that the Ritvik initiation as a conductor is a formal procedure. Prabhupada says that is a formality. And every initiated disciple of his divine grace already knew this. Oh, but it gets better. Saintly Sutz muddles the waters further by asking a question that serves as a further diversion. Quote, so they may also be considered your disciples? Unquote. What? If the Ritvik conducts the ceremony, the Yajamana is Prabhupada's disciple. If a disciple of his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, is actually guru, and conducts the ceremony also, then the Yajamana is not Prabhupada's initiated disciple, but he's the disciple of the Guru. He's Prabhupada's grand disciple. Just previous to this nonsense question by Satsuru, Prabhupada had stated, be actually Guru, but by my order. Prabhupada never gave the order, but he could have. Instead, in 1977, he reestablished the Ritvik process for resuming new initiations at that time. When Satsrup asked about the new initiations, the new initiates also being Prabhupada's disciples, a contradiction in and of itself. Prabhupada then tried to get things back on track and he said, quote unquote, why, consider, who? SDG's question was a nonsense, so Prabhupada wanted to get the whole interrogatory back on track, but TKG interrupted to make sure that he didn't. So TKG then comes in and says, no, he's, and when he says he's, he's referring to Satsarup, no, he's asking that these Ritvik Acharyas, they're officiating, giving Diksha, the people who they give Diksha to, whose disciples are they? Now the whole interview has gone beyond hope because TKG has directly mixed the officiating Ritvik with the one who is allegedly giving Diksha. 
These Nazis really blew it. The interview was a debacle. And that was primarily due to the complacent selection of wrong people to ask the questions which were never made specific even before that. The general sloppiness of the GBC, not making sure that the questions were designed to be pointed and clearly phrased. And all those GBCs were there listening to this. So at least one of them should have been on the ball enough to have intervened and get some clarification. At any rate, there is an interlude containing even more illusion, but His Divine Grace Shu the Prabhupada successfully, from the viewpoint of your host speaker, sums up the essence of this exchange. In doing so, he also clarified the second question of the initial inquiry. Prabhupada at the end of it says, quote, when I order you become guru, he becomes regular guru, that's all. He becomes disciple of my disciple, that's it, unquote. Vasu Gopal has a question. Vasu Gopal. Since Ritvik was the only order he gave after this room conversation, some say that Prabhupada ordered 11 of his disciples to become initiating spiritual masters after his departure when he appointed them as the officiating acharyas in July of 1977. Aren't Ritviks either exactly the same or at least very similar to regular gurus? Didn't those 11 men receive the order to initiate in this way? Well, that's the classic bewilderment and that's what all the leaders of so-called ISKCON push. No, the Ritvik is not automatically a Madhyamodhikari. He may be a Kanishta. In point of fact, it is the view of your host speaker that all of the Ritviks post-1970, and including 1970, who conducted all of those initiation ceremonies were neophytes. The concept of regular guru was introduced. The term was introduced. But the concept was already there and, is all, and had already always been there in Prabhupada's letters and even in his purports. Regular obviously means under regulation and that indicates the Madhyam Adhikari engaged in Vidhi Sadhana Bhakti. If any of those GBCs were Madhyams at the time of the room conversation, then Prabhupada could have recognized them as such and could have and likely would have appointed them as initiating spiritual masters on the spot. The order to be guru was never given by his divine grace to anyone, at least not officially. The order for 11 men to serve as Ritviks was given, nothing more, and that was nothing new. The founder of the Hare Krishna movement would not jeopardize his branch of the line by indirectly appointing Diksha Gurus through the back door and assigning them as Ritviks and leaving it as that. The, that, the presumption that he did so is an outrageous mental speculation. And if they were regular gurus, then why did they accept worship reserved for the Mahabhagavat? It's because they were not gurus. All of them were Sahajya deviants. The room conversation at Krishna Balaram in May of 1977 laid the groundwork for their later concoction after Prabhupada departed because it was at that time that they deviated from the expressed orders contained in May of 1977 in that room conversation. Those two bewildered sannyasis benefited from the muddle that they created with their nonsense questions, interruptions, and comments, but they only benefited for a while. So now let us move on to the sixth event that contributed to the formation and growth 
of so-called ISKCON. It flew under the radar for some time because it was unknown for many months. Eventually it became known, and it, that revelation created no shortage of heartbreak for many devotees when they finally heard about it. Of course, we are referring here to one of Prabhupada's very last orders when he ordered all of his disciples to come to him in India. He ordered all of his disciples to come to him in India. By late October and early November of 1977, it was starkly apparent to those who were in direct contact with him, to those who could see Prabhupada's physical manifestation, that he would almost certainly soon be leaving. Pictures of what he looked like at that time were not circulated movement-wide, but they should have been. How could anyone remain alive in that condition? His physical manifestation was shriveled and little more than skin and bones. But only those in India and in London, where he briefly visited before deciding to turn back to India, were actually aware of his physical condition. That physical condition was stark, and the vast majority of devotees worldwide were not aware of it. As such, he knew he was leaving, and in the end, he ordered that all of his disciples come to him. He ordered all of them to come to him, but that order was changed. A compromise was concocted between TKG and the new commissioner in Southern California who received the relay of Prabhupada's order that all the disciples were to come to him. Instead of all of them, the order got changed to two senior men from each zone. This modification was entirely unauthorized. Late November and December were the most important revenue months for the Western temples, particularly in America. It was known as the Christmas pick, and the male devotees wore Santa Claus suits. And many of those collectors, if they went to India, would choke off the revenue by doing so. So the order was changed, and all the devotees in the movement got shortchanged. Uh. Gokulananda has a question. Gokulananda. Besides the loss of revenue, how could this modification of the order constitute one of the 12 major deviations you are describing? Although devotees had their sentiments deeply disturbed that they were not informed of Prabhupada's wish, that alone seems to be rather unimportant. Is there some other factor besides the revenue loss that converts this modification into a major event which contributed to the degradation and destruction of his movement? There is, and we shall describe it. Changing the order was rationalized, obviously, as having to be made for the temples to keep meeting their expenses. The two leaders most implicated thought that Prabhupada just might hold on for the rest of the year, which would include the Christmas pick. Now, there may have been more than two implicated in this change, this disregard of the order, but for various reasons that's unclear and it's almost certain it'll never be cleared up. When the order was given, the Christmas pick was still a few weeks away, but obviously December was the focus of those two men directly implicated in the change. But here's the point and the answer to your question. Something else transpired when the order was changed. And what transpired was it proved that Prabhupada no longer controlled his disciples and it was now their movement. He also ordered that he be taken out on parikram in those final months, but TKG would not allow it. He, TKG defied the order. When Hung Sadhuta mentioned to TKG that it was the Guru's order, so they should follow it, 
TKG read Hunksa due to the Riot Act, accusing him of wanting to kill Prabhupada. That accusation, by the way, possibly had a mind-boggling irony connected to it. By October of 1977, Prabhupada's orders meant little or nothing to the big guns, or at least to many of them, who now controlled the movement from the top echelon, a movement that His Divine Grace had founded, developed, and directed. The GBC now controlled it. And whoever controlled or whichever powerful faction controlled the GBC, in effect, controlled the whole movement. Even while Prabhupada was still physically present and could give orders and did give orders. This compromise, this change of the order, is proof positive that it was no longer Prabhupada's movement. Although really that had been the case for quite some time, even before late October of 1977. Prabhupada had been made a figurehead. But this particular defiance of the order promotes the fact that since all of his disciples were not ordered to come to him, it is in the category of a very major event. That the devotees at large eventually found out about it is in and of itself a minor miracle because this compromise by his leading secretaries was meant to be kept a secret. So in summary, we see here in the description of these three events that have just been presented, at least two major compromises. It was compromise after compromise that led to the death blow of the movement in the spring of 1978. Prabhupada never liked compromise as he made clear in at least four excerpts from his letters. Here is one of those experts, da excerpts dated July 27, 1973, to his original commissioner in Southern California, quote, No compromise. Ramakrishna, avatars, yogis, everyone was enemy to Guru Maharaj. He never compromised. Some God brothers complained that this preaching was the chopping technique and it would not be successful. But we have seen that those who criticized, they fell down. For my part, I have taken up the policy of my Guru Maharaj. No compromise." Unquote. Previous to this letter, on January 3rd, 1972, he had written in another letter, quote, My Guru Maharaj never compromised in his preaching, nor will I, nor should any of my students. Unquote. At the Vaishnava Foundation, we implement this policy of no compromise. Perhaps adhering to it makes for the exercise of the chopping technique on our part. But even if it does so, we still follow it. We do not compromise, and neither should you. Sadeva Samya.